hi all. Welcome to our afternoon session of the AI in the corporate track. Uh, so our speaker is going to be uh, Moran Cohen from Anodoc, and he will tell you about architecting a large-scale time series forecasting service. Please go ahead, Moran. Thank you, Amitai. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, staying this late. Um, so before we dive into the, uh, the talk, let's, uh, let me give you a few words about uh, context about Anodot. So our mission statement is we use AI to constantly monitor and correlate business performance, uh, providing real-time alerts and forecasts, reducing time to detection and resolution, and dramatically imp impacting bottom lines. And uh, we have custom, we are a, a, an agnostic uh, product, so we have uh, uh, customers from many verticals, uh, like web, fintech, gaming, uh, telcos, and uh, uh, they're counting on us to do uh, business, real-time business monitoring. Um, our services are based on a time series. Uh, so um, our most established services are uh, in the detection. So we detect trend uh, and anomalies. And we also had help uh, to find root cause uh, of uh, incidents in very large scale uh, uh, data sets. And uh, recently we uh, started adding uh, forecast related services, uh, which is what I'm going to discuss in this talk. Uh, and the principle of our product is that uh, it should be auto ML and no code. So it should be usable by non-expert users and that it should, be a con it should uh, work continuously. Um, so, meaning that when new data arrives, then new insights uh, can be, then insights can be either updated or new insights can be uh, generated. So, this is what you would expect in a, a intuitively in a time series forecast. So, you have historical data of measurements uh, uh, over time. Uh, you have related uh, measurements possibly, you have uh, data about uh, events that occurred, uh, events can uh, be things that uh, you learned in the past but you can already foresee them like uh, Black Friday or uh, holidays that can influence the behavior of this metric, of this time series. And uh, what you would like to, to do is to get a forecast uh, of the next uh, for in this example, four weeks. So the use cases that we saw uh, in, in the business are, come from uh, multiple verticals, but just to, uh, to give an example, so for example, in e-commerce, if you can forecast the volume of uh, shopping per product, then it, you can uh, probably better plan the logistics for, to, to achieve faster delivery. Or in fintech, if you have, uh, if you can forecast well the number of uh, with withdrawal requests over time, then you can plan uh, your money reserves. And we have other uh, examples uh, in other verticals as well. So this is the high uh, level. Uh, this is the process at high level. So. The first step is that uh, you need to provide the data. Our product uh, works, has its own, uh, it's a software as a service, and we collect the data from uh, the customer's uh, system. So we have data collectors for many, uh, uh, many, many systems, BI systems, databases uh, that our customers have. And uh, these data collectors uh, uh, fetch, aggregate uh, time series, store them, index them for use and for, for us to provide the additional uh, time series services on this data. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so and there are two types of uh, data that are interesting in the context of uh, forecast, at least in our context. One is time series, which means uh, measurements, ongoing measurements of uh, uh, business metrics. And the other is events which can be, uh, which can relate to past and future uh, occurrences of uh, events. So the next step after uh, having the data um, uh, pulled by our, streaming into our system is to define a, a, the, the focus task. So let's take a, as an example, uh, suppose that I work for a delivery company and I want to 
uh, and I'm responsible to plan uh, a week ahead the number of uh, drivers that should service uh, deliveries. I'm, I, want, I would like to uh, know the number of orders per city to, to get an estimate uh, for them. And for that, I would need one week ahead of uh, this uh, forecast. I would need a, a resolution of uh, hourly for the sake of uh, planning. And I also know that uh, this thing, this is uh, influenced by local holidays, which are events, or the past week's marketing spend. And uh, very important is also how I uh, evaluate what it means to be accurate. So I, as the business user, uh, uh, will specify what it means uh, to be accurate based on my own needs, based on how I'm going to use uh, these forecasts. Okay, so now uh, from the user's part, uh, they provided everything. We have data streaming, they defined uh, what uh, they need, uh, they, they defined the, the context of the forecast uh, for the system, and now it's the system's job. So how does it work uh, in the system? So there is some uh, pre-processing, uh, there is some model training afterwards, and then uh, we train more models than we actually keep for later, uh, and then we, we keep a customized focused model and save it. So this, the first phase is the training phase, it's the heavier uh, phase of course, I will go into it a uh, little bit uh, in a few slides. And uh, there is the ongoing phase of uh, forecasting where the models stay the same, uh, only new data comes in and uh, we apply the, the, the saved model to this, uh, to this new data in order to create new forecasts. And so finally, we already have, we have a live forecasting task. It's already live, it's already producing. As data comes in, it produces uh, forecasts and we want to uh, consume it. So we have uh, all sorts of uh, dashboards and uh, from which you can download the CSV as reports. You can get uh, push alerts. You can pull from an API the results if you want to automate based on, uh, uh, on this. So that's the, the, the process at the high level. Now, uh, let's go a little bit back and, and uh, look at what, uh, what kind of requirements we have from, uh, from the autonomous uh, forecasting part of, uh, of our product. So two things are already supplied to us because we, we, we built this system as part of a bigger system that we already had. So, the, so we had unified input in terms of data collectors and we had unified output, uh, which is a way for us to provide the uh, the results of the forecast, like uh, dashboards and the uh, APIs. So what's special, what are the things that uh, we still need to implement which are specific to the forecasting part? So we want, uh, like, like I said in the beginning, the principles of our product are to be automated. We don't want, we want the user to say what to forecast, but the system to decide how. Uh, we want to achieve high accuracy uh, in the business context. Okay, and I, it's a little vague, but we'll uh, look at it later. Uh, we added, so this is, so flexibility, it's not, a, a, it may appear a bit uh, strange here, but uh, we want to, the ability to customize quickly, to add algorithms, to add uh, different ways to, uh, uh, to, uh, to experiment with uh, new algorithms. So this is a, an example which is uh, more related uh, to us as developers. Uh, we want it uh, to be continuous. This is part of the, uh, what we offer and we, it has to be large scale because we offer a, a, a software as a service and this is, uh, a, we don't want to be limited by scale. We want to be able to scale, uh, not, not to be limited by the software to scale. So let's take a look at what it means in our context to do a AutoML. So some things that we uh, encountered are uh, uh, that we have uh, models for time series forecasting, existing models like uh, uh, multiple architectures of LSTM networks. We have linear mo uh, models like uh, Arima and uh, Holt Winters. Uh, we use the special uh, probab probabilistic uh, methods like Prophet and other models on one side. And on the other side, there are all sorts of pre-processing which can be applied to the data before the model. 
which means basically adding features uh, for models that can, that can accept them. So we can add anomaly-based features, or we can, add, uh, we can uh, select and correlate uh, events more uh, uh, exactly, use all sorts of normalizations. This is pre-cleaning, this is pre-processing. And uh, the concept that we have, uh, so we borrow the concept from uh, scikit-learn of pipelines, which essentially describes uh, an entire process from uh, the pre-processing up, up to learning the model. Uh, so what we want to do is we start with, uh, so if we go back to how a user defines a forecast task, they, it would normally not be on one time series. It would be on a, a large class of conceptually related uh, time series, like, uh, for example, if I want to look at orders, uh, split by location. So there are many uh, target time series uh, that we're trying to optimize uh, to build a good model for each one of them. And there are many treatments, that, there are many pipelines that we can apply to each one of them. But this is a very a big search space. And uh, some points in this spa search, uh, search space are also costly. So the first thing that we do is to uh, make a plan based on uh, the time series uh, and the time series and the task definition. So we reduce some of the search that is involved here. Then after we, uh, on what's uh, remaining, the points that need to be checked, then we train a model uh, on, the, on all the points here. And from those models, uh, we, we, we evaluate those models on, uh, on the left out uh, set. And then we select the best models uh, from, this, uh, from this set. And eventually, after selection, we, we ensemble some of the models uh, as we see fit. So, why did we, we, why did we do all this uh, complicated uh, process? Because we want to achieve accuracy. Uh, but what is accuracy in the sense, of, in, uh, accuracy is, is complicated in the sense of business. Because sometimes uh, when, I, uh, when I specify uh, that I want uh, an accurate model, I need to, to, to make a selection. I need to select, do I want, uh, do I want uh, to uh, be more, uh, the arrows to go more back upwards uh, versus downwards. I may want to uh, add information about certain regions of the data that should be considered uh, of, uh, uh, should have lesser weight because I know that uh, they be, the, that behavior is not going to replicate in the future. Uh, I may want to combine a simple uh, loss criteria to, uh, to more complicated ones. And there are some things like I want models to be uh, consistent over time. So if, uh, if I add another point, I want to maintain, I want to punish models that will, cha will change uh, too much. And all of this is uh, based on, uh, for, from the user perspective. These are things that uh, can come into play. So what are the methods that we, uh, by which we try to achieve accuracy? So the, the basic one is to find a model which, can, uh, which you can optimize directly to the loss function that was selected. Uh, and this is the, the first case. And the thing is, is that uh, in many cases, the models that can be optimized for uh, very complicated uh, <clears throat> loss measures, they are usually heavier and costlier to, uh, uh, to train. That's one thing. And sometimes we, we just use more simpler uh, models that just can't, uh, that you can't uh, use uh, any loss. They just support uh, a few uh, losses. So the second method we use is sometimes we, tra we will train models based on what they can be trained on. So for example, we would, like, we would take a pretty close loss criteria. And then we would select the models based on the task a loss measure. Okay, so the model's internal loss can be different from the, the task's a loss. 
Okay, so by now we understand that, uh, uh, that the use cases in forecasting are, not, uh, are, are very dependent on the, on the business context. So it's not uh, one size fits all. So we needed to add uh, also uh, flexibility, not just as uh, developers, but also in order to accommodate uh, new cases. And there are two issues in flexibility that I, that I want to discuss here. So the first one, uh, we, we, we take many uh, algorithms that are out, uh, besides our own algorithms, we take also algorithms that are uh, out uh, in the wild, like uh, Profit, uh, like uh, Deep Neural Networks uh, implemented on TensorFlow. We have our own uh, Java implementations of, uh, uh, of uh, linear time series uh, uh, algorithms. And, um, and the thing is that they don't live well on the same platform because the runtimes may vary. The, the, the optimal runtime for each one of these uh, solutions, it can, it can vary. So uh, it can vary by the hardware platform, if it's GPU or CPU, or by the language and runtime environment that is used, or by conflicting uh, library versions. And these are problems that we uh, try to avoid by uh, containerizing uh, our pipelines. So we created the containers for each uh, separate uh, runtime environment. And uh, what, what this gave us is uh, that they are, they are now independent. Okay, so they have ra separate runtime dependencies. If I make a change on, a, I need to make a change to the platform, to, to the runtime of Profit, it doesn't affect TensorFlow, or it doesn't uh, affect our uh, uh, Java, uh, our Java implementations. And other things that we got from it was it, now that we have a process of already wrapping a new runtime, it's easy to add a new runtime. So if, if I want to add R or, or PyTorch, it's just repeating the same formula. Uh, another thing we get from it, it is that uh, the build and deploy and run are reproducible. So I can build, if I, if I run a build, uh, it, is, it is a script that uh, doesn't change, it doesn't depend on, uh, uh, it, it just depends on the changes in the code. Uh, deployment means that if I deploy in a testing environment, and then I, uh, it's pretty much predictable what will happen in the production environment. And run means that when I run a task to, uh, to train a model, then I should expect exactly the same behavior both in, uh, in, in, in both runs, which helps uh, a lot to debug uh, these issues. And uh, one thing that we found uh, very helpful, you can see that all these containers uh, contain uh, some uh, Python. One thing that we found uh, very helpful was to have a common Python main uh, function, uh, like the ent entry point, and just to integrate uh, via uh, bridge, uh, bridge libraries like JPipe for Java, or with RPy2 for, uh, for R. So that was uh, uh, very helpful rather than uh, rewriting and adding boilerplate by writing implementations in each, uh, in each language. So next, the next challenge is, uh, was about adding, uh, making, adding the new pipelines flexible. So we want to make the pipelines uh, configuration flexible because we want to, ex to be more uh, agile and experiment with things. And if I just want to add another uh, scaling uh, transformation, I don't need to rewrite code uh, and things like that. So that was the, the idea. Uh, so we wanted to avoid adding code when, uh, when possible, when it makes sense. And another thing that we learned in uh, earlier versions of uh, this system is that, uh, that the, uh, the parameters can creep and become uh, very large. So for example, uh, if I had some basic uh, model that gets trained and I, had, uh, and I add uh, a flag that says, okay, rescale this feature, and I add another flag that says, okay, add or don't add this feature, then what I will get is a very huge uh, list of parameters which will be very hard, uh, which will be very hard uh, to maintain in code and would be very hard to write uh, in a configuration. So the solution we, we did uh, for that was to uh, write modular configuration. And it starts with uh, writing basic components uh, of uh, functionality. So, each, so components are 
uh, pieces of uh, small pieces of functionality like uh, running a regressor, running some transformation, uh, and we combine them together as a pipeline. So a pipeline is, like, is in particular a top-level compo component that, that knows how to combine sub-components. Uh, so it aggregates other components. And you can see typically what a pipeline would look like. Uh, again, if you know scikit-learn, then this is very, uh, should sound very familiar. You have several transformations. So for example, this pipeline describe, describes the process of taking a data frame scaling uh, some uh, columns on that data frame and then adding several, some features to that data frame and finally running uh, this uh, regressor, uh, fitting this regressor on it. And everything uh, is defined as a YAML uh, in YAML. So it's uh, like a light domain specific language for the, for the pipelines. So uh, the next the next step was to actually, how do we build the search space that uh, I discussed in the beginning? So what we used here was uh, uh, the Jinja library from Python, and it enables us to define the array of pipelines for search. So if earlier it was just one pipeline, then this is a, an entire, a, a very large list uh, of pipelines that is uh, generated. And this is the, the good thing. So what you can see here, for example, is, okay, I want to try this process with the same uh, pre-processing, but what I want to, to be different between the two, uh, between the pipelines is just, I want to experiment with different layer combinations. So for example, if I have an LSTM network, I just want to, to play with the number of units in each layer. Um, and so this is like a very simple uh, case, but the Jinja language itself, it's very expressive. You can have conditions, add variables, macros, and of course it can take uh, parameters from the outside when it renders this, uh, this plan. Okay, so now that we have a method to build the, the self space, um, let's look at the challenges that we had with uh, achieving a large scale. I mean, there, there is still, a lot of training that needs to happen in this uh, uh, for, for a focus task. And uh, so let's look at uh, the challenges. So first, uh, typically I think this is something that uh, many people encounter. You have two types of loads. So we, ha we have uh, the, the time of the training phase. So you get a new task and then there is a spike of uh, training that needs to happen. So it's very high uh, CPU load and it requires many machines uh, or otherwise it will never uh, finish. And on the other hand, so this is the training phase. And on the other hand, you have in the ongoing phase only adding uh, new points and running uh, inference. So the solution we used uh, in this case, and of course it can be implemented by other means as well, uh, we use the AWS batch because this is a managed solution. So we didn't have to write code to maintain uh, resources versus the number of jobs. Uh, but that, ca that can also be implemented, but we didn't want uh, to, to do it uh, directly. And the good thing about this service was the, it, uh, the terms here that, uh, that are used are compute environment. So you say what kind of computers you want. Uh, you define queues from which the compute environments consume jobs. And all we have to do is just fill, uh, fill the job queue. And the system will, will take care of uh, increasing the, the number of, uh, of uh, virtual machines, physical machines, uh, whatever is needed. So this was our solution for this uh, challenge. The other challenge is how do we orchestrate? So the first, the, the first part we discussed, okay, how can I run many small tasks, but as I said, uh, the grid search is, it eventually belongs to one task. We need somehow to uh, look at, at, at the whole, uh, uh, at all, the, all of this search as one task. And um, also there are some shared things between the pipeline, but between the pipeline training, like getting the data, fetching the data from the storage and running some basic statistics that is used and running correlations between metrics. And 
also some other things that you would expect, like logging. And uh, what we did for that, we used Apache Airflow. And Apache Airflow is a, a, is a system that, that allows us to write a workflows called the uh, DAGs, Directed Acyclic Graphs. Um, so it, we, what, we have, what we have to do is just define the individual uh, tasks and draw lines between them uh, that uh, describe uh, the dependencies. And uh, so this is uh, so. So this helped us uh, see both uh, the task at the granular level for each pipeline individually when needed, and on the other hand, uh, to see each uh, each tra each very large uh, distributed training job as well as uh, as a combination. And another added thing is that our system uh, is usually deployed in a Kubernetes cluster, and it was it, it was it is pretty straightforward to scale Airflow on a, on a Kubernetes cluster. But not everything was perfect. We had some issues with uh, uh, integrating uh, Airflow and AWS Batch for our case. So, for example, uh, Airflow doesn't. So the dynamically adding uh, tasks is something that goes a bit against the grain of. Uh, how Airflow works, they expect like the, 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 comp the complex tasks, they expect them to be, to be slowly changing, which is not our case. Uh, so what we did was to write our own uh, uh, process to, to synchronize a bit from a task repository and handle this life cycle. Another issue we encountered was that uh, Airflow and AWS, the, the original uh, AWS batch uh, operator that came with Airflow, it can't, uh, couldn't create tasks uh, dynamically. That's inherent pro problem in Airflow. Uh, and another thing was that the, the, the jobs on the Airflow side took a, a had a very large footprint. So what we did, since, since Airflow is, uh, was in Python, it was already very familiar to uh, to extend it, so we created our own uh, AWS batch operator that can uh, manage the, the pipeline tasks. Um, another thing was, uh, so AWS batch has its own logging, uh, so it was also a, a little bit of a pain, but, it got, but it, that was the reason that we created an Airflow UI plugin which we later extended for, uh, for managing uh, the back end of this, uh, of this system. So finally, this is uh, how our system uh, looks in the end. And uh, on, on one hand, on one side, we have a Kubernetes cluster that is running a, a web API, which, uh, which is actually responsible for communicating with the outer world to, to receive new forecasting tasks and to store them uh, in, in a task repository. And we have the, the Airflow scheduler, uh, and, and we have the Airflow scheduler responsible for triggering new tasks, such now is the time to do training, now is the time to run, a, a, to run forecast. Uh, we have the, action, the web server that I mentioned that, was ext that we extended in order to uh, add some uh, more visibility un into the processes that we that we have, and finally there is the Airflow worker, which uh, which is actually responsible for uh, for creating the large uh, the the, tra the bigger training tasks. So the, like I said, the bigger training tasks are run in AWS Batch, and um, so. What the way that it works with the Airflow is that some process on Airflow needs to be the babysitter for all the processes here. So the reason that we had uh, issues in the past was that we had, for each process here, we had one babysitter process here. So that created a very large uh, uh, footprint on the Airflow side. Uh, so once we wrote our own operator, we have one worker uh, process managing uh, all the uh, the task relevant to that forecast job. And like I said, AWS Batch, we can, we can just, we just dump uh, the tasks into uh, AWS Batch and this service uh, takes care of uh, allocating the resources. So the key takeaway is uh, to summarize, uh, so 
when we so when we talked about AutoML, our our uh, direction is to to do a search around the pre-processing and model combinations, and uh, then to achieve accuracy, we have we support multiple ways to ensemble and select uh, the successful models. We added the flexibility by uh, making our by making the pipelines run in containers, and we uh, created the modular configuration. And uh, we used Airflow to manage the whole process. And the, lar I, I, the large scale we achieved due to uh, using uh, AWS Batch. But like I said, the, 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 main, the main thing here is to decouple the node reservation, the actual physical or virtual machines, uh, resources from dispatching the tasks. OK, thank you very much. No, no, we are looking into time series forecast. So that's the initial part you missed. <laughs> so yeah, we want to, we have uh, possibilities to create alarms based on forecasts. So if you see that the forecast, for instance, no, 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 the goal is, uh, yeah, the goal is uh, forecasting. 